breast cancer survivor. Oh my God, this is the first time I say it. Good morning. We're gathered here today to discuss the management of the HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, gathered in the table with us are three other experts in the area. I am Dr. Silva, a surgical oncologist at the Fred and Pamela Buffett Cancer Center at the Nebraska Medical Center in Nebraska, and I will have my colleagues introduce themselves. I'm uh, Lisa Carey. I'm the Chief of Hematology Oncology at the University of North Carolina Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm uh, Wadad Hanna. I'm a breast pathologist at Sunnybrook Health Science Center, Professor of Pathology at University of Toronto, Canada. I'm Julia White. I'm the Director of Breast Radiation Oncology at the Stephanie Spielman Comprehensive Breast Center at the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center. Continuing our discussion on the management of the HER2 positive breast cancer patient, we will be addressing the, a second case in this individual being a 56-year-old postmenopausal female employed in a restaurant. The lesion was found by exam, it's three centimeters in size, and our pathologist have established that this is not only HER2 positive, but also estrogen receptor as well as progesterone receptor positive. The patient appears not to have any palpable clinically detectable disease. The patient does have some understanding of her circumstances. Unfortunately, she is employed and this would affect the extent to which she may be able to comply with all of the complicated care that we may ultimately be addressing. Uh, to that extent, we would like to address our panel and uh, give us some recommendations on the management of this patient who is ER positive and HER2 positive and whether that patient would benefit at all from the use of preoperative neoadjuvant therapy in this setting of a node negative T2 lesion. Dr. Kerry? Well, you know, so a three centimeter tumor, uh, you know, in a patient who is highly motivated for breast conservation is oftentimes over the threshold where we start considering administering the drugs up front simply because for cosmetic reasons, a uh, three centimeter tumor is usually not going to give a, a very good cosmetic result. Um, you know, on the other hand, she is node negative. Um, and, and I think this is where some of the nuances come in. If, in fact, her tumor was was pathologically smaller than that. Let's say, for example, she had a you know more like a two centimeter or smaller tumor, and that was truly node negative. She would be eligible for a much reduced chemotherapy regimen with the trastuzumab paclitaxel regimen that was published in the New England Journal uh, last year. Mm -hmm. And so I do think this is where the multidisciplinary effort is really key because these are the kind of nuances that we want to bring to the front as we're, as we're talking about what we're committing a patient to. Because, you know, conventional neoadjuvant therapy is polychemotherapy plus HER2 targeting. In our conference, Dr. Hanna, there's always discussion about patients like this, because people tend to look askew at the patient that has very high ERPR titers, and they also have a, a measurable HER2 titer, and we always turn to our mm -hmm. pathologists, can we believe that? Is this truly a good patient with a bad HER2 measurement, or a good patient with a reliable HER2 measurement? This is a good point because actually uh, when I see HER2 positive, I tend to expect that the ER, PR will be negative, particularly the PR. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see ER positivity, uh, and but usually PR negative. When you see the triple positive, you want to make sure that the HER2 is truly positive. And what I mean by that is the IHC is three plus strong, complete membrane staining, usually in most of the tumor cells. If you have any doubt in your mind, we reflex to insight to hybridization to ensure that this is true positivity. Particularly if you will look at the histological subtype. For example, if it is lobular carcinoma, very unusual to have this, but in about four or five percent of invasive lobular, you can see the triple positive, particularly the pleomorphic. So I think as a pathologist, that's why we look at the histology, we look at the uh, ER, PR, and HER2 together to make sure that what you say is positive is truly positive. Can I just add something though? I think this, mm -hmm. is, a, this is an arena that's evolving. You know? mm -hmm. So as Dr. Hannah well knows, you know, when we look on a molecular level at triple positive versus hormone receptor negative HER2 positive, you know, those are different, you know, those, the Disease. components are very different, right? So actually, the vast majority of triple positive tumors, which is a, I mean, it's basically half of HER2 positive mm -hmm. breast cancers are also hormone receptor positive, mm -hmm. and the majority of them are in fact luminal. 
on molecular subtyping. Mm -hmm. So that is very plausible that, that in fact what we do conventionally, clinically, which is a focus on HER2 targeting and hormone receptor targeting is in fact appropriate for these patients. Uh, you have to be very careful with the making sure that the pathology is well yeah, done, but yeah. it certainly is plausible. We also know that there is other biological mechanism, molecular pathway, for example, the PIC3 uh, is now, patient with PIC3 uh, mutation will not have complete pathological response, or P10, for example, also low P10. Of, of course, this is not still the standard of care, but mm -hmm. something to look for. The other one, which is a little bit easier because you look at uh, the histology, is the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes very good predictor of response. Again, there are studies, and I think in this meeting there's a couple of presentations at ASCO related to that, so there may be other things helping us to decide or predict response to new adjuvant targeted therapy. When we've had these cases, there's always someone who will say, well, why don't you get a mammoprint on this patient and make sure that the HER2 is truly HER2, and then remarkably we'll get someone that comes back, just like Dr. Curry said, luminal A or B with yeah. no Herceptin expression and then no, you wonder true. how did that happen. There is a very important thing to decide, even Oncotype can do the HER2 as well and MEMA mm -hmm. print, is that these are two different methodologies. So and I think to me the targeted therapy is to the protein. We know that this is transmembrane receptor. So I believe that if the protein is positive, that's what I'm targeting. Because sometimes, very rarely, less than 2%, you will find amplification of the gene without translation into a protein. And to me, I still think this case is positive, and right. I'm treating the protein. And all the data we have is based on the protein, exactly. mm -hmm. not in the pre yeah. previous yeah. RNA, you know, methods. Yeah. And just to be very clear, you're arguing, as I think, you know, ASCO Cap would, uh, that you cannot use RT-PCR-based methodology to determine HER2 status, <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Kerry, in this case, uh, you made a very important point, Dr. Reed, my colleague, office, obviously oftentimes brings this up. If the patient was truly clinically node negative, would her treatment plan be different in the post-operative adjuvant setting than that in the preoperative new adjuvant setting? You know, so, you know, this is where you start getting into, you know, the, the nuances of what we do. If, in fact, she ended up with, you know, and pathologically she was a three centimeter node negative tumor, there were very few patients with that size tumor included in the APT trial, which tested the, the, the one chemotherapy drug plus trastuzumab. So I think I would be uh, hesitant to, unless she had other, you know, comorbidities or things where I really wanted to omit chemotherapy. So I probably would give her, you know, a polychemotherapy traditional regimen um, uh, if, in fact, it was three centimeter and node negative, yeah. And as Dr. Hanna pointed out earlier, um, how do you present the advantages of this regimen to somebody who may have a lifestyle that may preclude the comings and goings to chemotherapy and would say, just, just do surgery first and tell me if I can avoid chemotherapy altogether? Well, again, if, you're, if there's uncertainty, you know, mm -hmm. let's say that you have a clinical exam, a radiographic exam using mammogram, ultrasound, whatever, mm -hmm. and they all say that it's a three centimeter tumor. So you really mm -hmm. don't have, I mean, then it's, it's a question of whether you can minimize the surgical needs by the use of, of neoadjuvant therapy. If, in fact, it's that tumor, it won't matter whether or not the, the systemic drugs are given preoperatively or postoperatively. Right. They're going to be the same. And right. you would try and choose a regimen right. that was every three weeks, for example, to make it easier for the patient. Um, if there's uncertainty, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it might be smaller and it might get into the two centimeter or smaller realm where you would feel a little more comfortable with minimizing the chemotherapy, then I think that's an argument for going to surgery first. I think, Dr. Hanna, you suggested that your expectation in this setting would be that the potential for a PCR would be lesser in this setting than in a patient in whom you had a truly ERP or negative status. Yeah, there's a couple of studies that shows uh, a difference between 60% and 40% with the, so a HR positivity is one of the predictors of complete uh, versus partial uh, pathological response. So regardless of the HER2 status, the fact that they're ER positive is still a good sign. Mm, true, because mm. now you're going to have adjuvant it, endocrine yeah, therapy yeah, to yeah. target. <laughs> That's another thing to get. Exactly. <laughs> Dr. Hodge, from your standpoint, in the absence of any stigmata of extensive disease in the axilla, 
you would basically then treat this patient with a more standard post Yeah, so I think, first of all, I think you need to confirm, I think our fingers are not reliable of um, uh, of definitions of, of node negatives, depending on the ba patient's body habits particularly. So I would, I would confirm, if she's clinically node negative, I think she has a lot of options to her then. So if she chooses, to, uh, whether she has upfront surgery or after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, elects to, to retain her breast, um, she would, could be treated with um, standard breast radiotherapy without nodal therapy. Um, and that she avoids some morbidity with that and some toxicity, and she would be also eligible for a more accelerated radiotherapy. She can have her treatment now, um, at least the whole breast portion, in 15 or 16 treatments, and for a busy woman who's having trouble getting away from work, being spared those 10 extra trips to the radiotherapy center and not sacrificing efficacy of the, of the cancer treatment and, uh, or, the, or excess toxicity, I think, is a, I'm sure she would see as a bonus, most patients do. Um, but, and I also think it's important to make sure she's clinically node negative if she elects mastectomy because then she'd be more willing to have her plastic surgeon, our plastic surgeon colleagues and when they're present are more willing to do immediate breast reconstruction if they don't have to be so worried that we're going to add regional nodal radiotherapy on um, after uh, at any point. So it's a real benefit to... So would you sample the axilla then uh, at the time of surgery? Right. So normally we would always gauge axilla with ultrasound in all patients. Mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the clinical standing. Mm. Uh, but the point you make regarding the radiation via VR plastic surgeons is one that we grapple with all the time. Um, mm. Because particularly in patients who wish to have a single, or which is not a very common occurrence, but at least a two-stage reconstruction, then we have to figure out where to sandwich the radiation therapy in, whether before expansion or after expansion. And in either case, the plastic surgeons are not too happy. So that if you were to assure them, as you pointed, that the likelihood of them needing radiation therapy in the post-mastectomy setting is small, they'll be far more enthusiastic about proceeding with the reconstruction without fear. And I think, absolutely, and that's why I just, the point is that we want to make sure that even in patients who are, we think are node negative by our exam, mm -hmm. there's a real benefit to doing the ultrasound and appropriate biopsying as necessary because then you offer her a lot, and the plastic surgeons, a lot more flexibility in how they approach reconstruction. Well, you probably would want to stage the axilla before she went to their definitive right. surgical approach. Yeah, right. I, I either, either in, in, before you start the chemo yeah, or before yeah. you go to exactly. surgery. Exactly. I, th I think it, it, yeah. it helps a lot. I mean, it used to be that we would have to request an axillary ultrasound staging on a patient. Now it's pretty much a standard routine for That's all right. our patients. I mean, it's pathologically. Yeah. Oh, I mean, pathologically, pathologically yeah. yeah. Standard mm -hmm. node biopsy, of course, would be yeah. uh, at uh, some point. <laughs> if you're not, you don't want to do that. If she's, not, I mean, yes, if she's not going to have chemotherapy, um, but uh, we do worry about if she, for some reason, if she turned out to be positive, and you do a sentinel node bi biopsy prior to the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. You've, re, you've moved an important predictor of response. Um, so especially for at least local regional nodal, it um, seems based on reanalysis, terimamulus, uh, reanalysis of B27 and B18, um, uh, in their multivariable analysis, nodal response was more important than breast response. And, and so we have to, we want to make sure we keep that intact. If on the outside chance, she's sniffing negative, right? Just everything, if everything comes out where, so multiple people think she's negative. We don't necessarily need to do a sentinel node biopsy up front if you're planning chemotherapy, but certainly I shall get that sentinel node biopsy with surgery. But just uh, to make sure we confirm it, I think the practice sometimes um, is variable across institutions of whether for node negative patients, it's, you, you be dogmatic about systematically evaluating the axilla prior to your first step of therapy. Yeah, I think that's uh, still. Uh, an issue nationally, uh, we have tended to go away from the center node biopsy prior to neoadjuvant. Um, a case like this, you could make an argument, and Dr. Reed has oftentimes asked that we consider it, because if she was truly node negative, then she may have some different recommendations in the adjuvant setting. Um, but having said that, if you do find that she's node positive, then as you pointed out, that signal is, is no longer part of your, of your treatment equation. Thank you very much for this particular case, and we'll be moving to the next case shortly.